This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad to be together for worship. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's interesting watching the seasons change. Um, so our, our, this would have been like smack in the middle of the sun before, and I've got shade now. But uh, um, And the sun is becoming more popular as the temperatures drop a little bit. But we're thankful for a beautiful day um, to gather together here for worship, and I want to welcome everybody. Um, and yes, I'm wearing a baseball cap, so my... My other cap is, hat is a favorite of mine, but it's kind of grungy looking, I realized when I saw myself on video. So this one looks a little bit nicer. So uh, yeah, hopefully that's okay. Um, but it's good to see everybody. And I just want to remind everyone to make sure you have a, a little communion cup uh, with you that has the wine or grape juice um, and uh, the wafer in it. You can just keep that with you until we get to that point in the service. Um, and, uh, and that everyone is invited to partake of Holy Communion together uh, today. Um, Want to just give a little quick update. I saw Carol Coots um, this week. She was over here mowing the lawn, and Jim is home from the hospital, but is still uh, quite weak. We had uh, asked for prayers for him last week. He had um, had to have a lot of fluid uh, kind of drained off, and uh, um, to the tune of more than 40 pounds worth, I guess. Wow. <laughs> so, um, but. Uh, He's kind of weak, but uh, is home and recovering, and so we continue to remember Jim in our prayers. Um, also want to let folks know next Sunday we'll be uh, kind of kicking off and celebrating our Sunday school year. And so uh, we're, we've been collaborating with our friends at Advent to kind of pick up what we did for Vacation Bible School um, and uh, have packets available for families that they can be using at home and we'll be distributing those at our outdoor service next Sunday and offering prayers for the for Sunday school. Um, and actually we'll be using the curriculum we had originally bought for our vacation Bible school called Rocky Railway. 
uh, but um, that, those, that material will be shared with our families. Um, but I'm really grateful for all of our leaders helping out with that. And then um, a reminder that this afternoon we're having our first um, activity at uh, uh, Faith Community Pathways uh, on pollinators with Dr. Thelma Heidel Baker. Um, even though that was kind of advertised as a family event, and it still is, um, it's definitely something we want to have kids come to and parents. Um, all ages are welcome. And so if you want to come and just learn a little bit more about pollinators and about what's happening out on the prairie, uh, Dr. T, uh, Thelma, is amazing. Um, if you haven't heard her before, it's a real treat. So that'll be 3 o'clock this afternoon. And uh, let's see, the last thing I was going to share, too, is that um, we are in the final uh, weeks now of uh, our Outreach for Hope bike ride. Um, just want to say thank you to everybody who's offered their support. Um, and uh, if you haven't yet, I uh, encourage you to do that. All of those gifts go 100% to Outreach for Hope and the ministries that they support throughout our synod um, in communities that have been hit by poverty, helping um, support creative ministry among congregations to address that and to bring people together. Um, so thank you for those gifts. And thank you to all of you who have ridden or walked or run. I think we've had all three of those categories here at our, with our team for Faith Lutheran Church. So thanks for that. Well, with that, I think we are ready to begin. I will lead us in uh, some words of confession and forgiveness as we begin our worship uh, this day. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Dottie Dorr is our reader today. Thank you, Dottie. And I'm going to invite her to the microphone to share our reading. Our first reading comes to us from the book of Jonah, the third chapter. After Jonah's short sermon in chapter 3, verse 4, the Ninevites all repent, and God decided to spare the city. Jonah objected to this and became even more angry when God ordered a worm to destroy a plant that was providing shade to Jonah. The book ends with a question that challenges any who are not ready to forgive. You, Jonah, are all worked up about a bush, but shouldn't I be concerned about 120,000 Ninevites? We read, when God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them and did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, 
and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 100 than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read responsively Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will sp speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall tell of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will recount your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Philippians, the first chapter. Paul writes to the Philippians from prison. Though he is uncertain about the outcome of his imprisonment, he is committed to the ministry of the gospel and calls on the Philippians to live lives that reflect and enhance the gospel mission. We read, for to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and enjoy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle 
that I that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And uh, Steve has a, a musical interlude prepared for us. And thank you, Steve.
I'm uh, not going to do it justice, but Steve shared a little bit during our live stream this morning about um, that tune called Kingsfold, which shows up uh, in a bunch of different hymns in our hymn book. But the one that I had picked for the live stream this morning is called How Short Our Span of Life. And the author of the, uh, the text uh, muses on how short we are here. It's just kind of a breath or a drop in the ocean. And yet in our lives, God's eternity encounters us and we experience uh, God's love in Christ um, and uh, that victory over sin and death um, and what an opportunity that is. Uh, and so I just, I love that uh, little piece on Kingsfold that was just beautiful. Um, and so thinking of that, um, I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer uh, before I begin my sermon. Good and gracious God, thank you for the ways that you come to us in the midst of this brief life that we are part of. You come and you share our existence, you share our humanity, our joys, but also our suffering, our being born and our dying, that we may know the power of a love that never ends. Teach us the ways of your love. Teach us the ways of your son, Jesus. Teach us the way of the cross and the empty tomb. Teach us to love ourselves and to love one another as you have loved us. And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. So I want to reflect a little bit with you about the one line in Jesus' parable where the, the people who worked all day in the hot sun um, were uh, getting a little frustrated and complaining. And they say, you have made them equal to us. You have made them equal to us. So church, my question for you this morning is, how do you define the categories, us and them? Each of us may have a different kind of a way that we think about that, right? Uh, us and them. Their presence in Jesus' parable evokes a pretty enduring human tendency, I think, that we have toward defining ourselves and others according to any number of distinguishing factors. There's something reassuring about fitting in with a group or identifying a common enemy or being right and feeling indignant about those people, whoever they may be. Jesus' parable is especially uncomfortable because it confronts our strenuous efforts and our righteous causes with God's unrestricted generosity and favor. You might ask yourself if the landowner in Jesus' parable is going to pay those who worked only one hour, the equivalent of those who labored all day in the hot sun, then why should anyone work at all? Why do anything? But even more, such actions erase our categories to make everyone equal. So how do you define us and them? This is especially tenuous right now, as a deeply divided nation faces a contentious presidential election and competing sides square off against each other, both using deeply emotional appeals. The yard signs that spring up this time of year are but an outward manifestation of very different outlooks that increasingly view each other with hatred and fear. And each one may claim the justification that the workers did, who worked all day of hard work and an upright cause. And they may view the other side uh, with scorn, denigrating the other side as worthless and damaging. What can today's readings teach us about a better way? Although I've tried, to avoid partisanship in my ministry with you. I confess that it can be very hard to do, especially in matters that I'm passionate about. And I want to apologize if I have ever come across as uh, disrespectful or dismissive about opinions that are different than mine. Maybe this is another, just another way of saying that I'm human. 
I'm human. But also that as a disciple of Jesus, I recognize the possibility of something more. Something that requires everybody, all of the gifts of each person. Our congregation's ministry also consists of human beings prone to taking sides, but also capable of Jesus' inclusive way. This takes intentionality, though, and work. It takes intentionality and work. Our default moves very easily into partisan camps, particularly when so much partisanship surrounds us. The book of Jonah that we heard from a little part of here this morning, and actually it's a short book, so I would commend it to you. It's an interesting book, an unusual book. But the book of Jonah offers a rather unusual take on Israel's relationship with God, who is, and they would say this with great pride, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Wow, who wouldn't like that? But the question that it raises is what happens when this is granted to others? <laughs> to people on the opposing side, to Nineveh, to them. <laughs> what happens when it's granted to them? Jonah's response that he is angry enough to die Stop and think about that for a minute. He's angry enough to die. It's very telling. Anger can be a potent force for positive change, as when you care deeply enough about a person or a situation to realize that there's something wrong, something that you can address, something that you can do, and you get involved in it, and you take it up, and you fight for it, you work for it. Yet Jonah's anger did something different. It turned him inward, preferring destruction to any positive change. I'm angry enough to die. Sometimes we, like Jonah, may want God to just bring calamity on others, those people, the ones that I disagree with and I don't like and I don't understand, just wipe them out bring calamity, preferring destruction to forgiveness and reconciliation. And yet, church, after all of our righteous causes, all of our indignation at those with whom we disagree, at the end of the day, all we have is each other. All we have is each other and the possibility of God's love and grace. The Apostle Paul, in today's second reading, yearned for what we might call a spiritual escape, to be released from the struggles of his ministry to experience an idealized union with Christ. And yet he realized that the victory that Jesus shares isn't about escape, but rather it's about the places where he encounters and redeems us here and now. This is where our fruitful labor, our progress and our joy and faith, our striving and our suffering are made real as the crucified and risen one comes and is revealed among us. To settle into opposing camps of us and them is to miss the point. Our nation right now is remembering the example of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'm thinking especially of how her own deep commitments and passions didn't prevent her from collaboration and even friendship with others who held positions deeply opposed to her own. Maybe you've heard the stories of the friendship she actually shared with Judge, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia. And they were like polar opposites <laughs> in their views on things, but they were friends and they enjoyed being together. Church, whoever is elected president in November will not change the constituency of our neighbors and our nation. We still have to live 
and work together, no matter what happens. And Jesus' church has never depended on who is in power at any point in history. In every generation, we have the opportunity to live our corporate life in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the good news of Jesus' victory over sin and death. This includes not only your priorities or your cherished initiatives or prized accomplishments. Paul said it also includes your suffering. Even as Jesus suffered and died for you, even as he entered into the ambiguities and the struggles and the difficulties of life, suffering and dying for you and for the sake of others and for the whole world, that victory is not about winning, as we often think about it, but rather it is about the triumph of love. It's about the triumph of love. It teaches you to see the world as God sees it, to see yourself as God sees you, and to see your neighbor as God sees your neighbor, making the last first and the first last, loving you and your neighbor inviting you to join your voices in creation's song of grateful praise. Amen. We continue with our prayers of intercession, and Dottie is going to lead us in those, so I will invite you to the microphone, Dottie. Draw together in the compassion of God, we may pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip us for, the, for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities, nothing in creation is outside your concern, mighty God. Lord, in your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all who you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Where we find envy, and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy. Your Reveal yourself to all in need as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Accompany judges and lawyers, victims of crimes and those serving sentences. Give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy. Even beyond your expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life health, and courage to all who are in need, especially Larry Borchard, Carol Burry, Pat and Phil Dimmer, Dale Erickson, Eric Fossum, Becky Godfrey, Kristen Godfrey and Liam, Jimmy Gresh, Ellen Haynes, Carrie, Wayne Krieger, Presley, Carol Pokrant, Rennie Rappold, Jessica Struhar, Pat Verhillen, and John Zarling. Lord, in your mercy. Your we pray for those affected by wildfires out west and for those affected by the hurricanes and all other natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy. Your we pray for our clergy during this pandemic. Give them strength, courage, and comfort them and give them peace.
during this trying time. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And I invite you to take a moment to uh, uh, share a, a physically distant sign of peace. Or with those you came with, uh, that can be close. <laughs> but peace be with you. <laughs> peace. Steve's sharing a sign of peace around the corner, too. <laughs> As uh, we, we offer a prayer for our offering, um, I've been trying to share impact statements, and one that I'm going to share here today is maybe a little bit different. We may not think of that as an impact of our ministry, but I have really appreciated this, and we, we, couldn't, we had no way of knowing as the church council was working. They, you know, Al Gresh, our council president, had really worked hard to say we need to have a clear sense of our mission and our vision, and your, your elected leaders worked really hard on that. And it was really newly completed when this pandemic came upon us. And I want to tell you how much it is meant to have a clear sense of why we are here and what it is that we want to be known for at a time when it could just be about going wherever or just kind of eking out an existence. That direction has really helped us and really helped keep us going. And so I want to lift up the impact of people who are leaders in our ministry. Um, who took the time to think about that and work on that. We're going to be celebrating uh, that vision this fall with our stewardship campaign and looking at the four different kind of areas of how we want to be known as a congregation and how that's actually unfolding and happening. But as we do it, it really is a credit to the people who sat down and discerned that and put it together. Um, and so thank you for your support. That's part of the ministry that you help support here that helps provide direction and clarity for how we see God working among us and where we need to go. Um, so thank you for supporting and being part of that. And so we offer this prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And I want to take this moment, too, just to say, if you haven't done so already, we do have um, cups that are there with both wine and grape juice uh, that also contain the wafer in it. And so you can go over to the table kind of where you came in and make sure you grab one of those. And if you have one already with, with you, you can get that and take that out now. God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise, call us to your table, grant us your life. When the earth was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath, and the psalmists cried out for healing, and full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over your city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, 
Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. O God, you are breath. Send your spirit on this meal. O God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. O God, most majestic, O God, most motherly, O God, our strength and our song, you show us a vision of a tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior, life in you, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So at this time, I invite you uh, to, uh, you can remove the cover uh, for the, the bread and also the wine. And we remember these words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his in grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ, and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So, and um, Aaron caught, caught it this time, but we do have a wastebasket by the table, and so as you're on your way out, you can drop the cups uh, in there um, as, as you're ready to go. And now receive this blessing. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.